The MVP is one of the most prestigious and sought after NBA awards, but this award is typically only reserved for a few players. History has shown us that an MVP needs to be a star on a winning, usually a top three team, have amazing stats, and outside of a few scenarios cannot have a star teammate. Usually the MVP also needs a bit of a media narrative to try and push their story a little bit. Think like Derrick Rose or Russell Westbrook. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that the most valuable player actually wins the MVP. This year, Steph Curry is by far the most valuable player to any team, but he won't win MVP this year because his team is barely going to make the play-in tournament. A similar situation happened in 2005 where Kobe Bryant was one of the best players in the NBA averaging 28-6-6, doubling the scoring of the next best player, Lamar Odom. Kobe was what an MVP should be as he was one of the most valuable players to any team's success. Yet because his team could not win, he was not in any MVP talks. The aim of today's video is to take a look at players today in this situation guys who are having great players whose stats should be meriting MVP talks, but because they are in the 10th through 15th seeds, will not ever be talked about in the MVP. Okay, so I took all the teams from the 10th through 15th seeds and found the guys who are the most valuable to that team. I then ranked all the guys by who are the most valuable, breaking them into three categories. First are the borderline stars, guys who are unrecognized but have the skills to probably be the number two or number three on a championship team. Next we have the borderline superstars, and then after that we have the guys who are stars and if they were on a good team they would be in the MVP talks. The first player we have is Terrence Ross. The Magic are in a tough spot to say the least. They had three players who I would say could have been their MVP this year, Nikola Vucevic, Aaron Gordon, and Evan Fournier, but then all three of those guys suddenly disappeared for them at the trade deadline, leaving the Magic with no direction and no clear MVP this year. So really Terrence Ross has become the only series MVP candidate, averaging 15 points, 3 rebounds, 2 assists with half a block and a steal per game with a 53% true shooting percentage and one win share game. He is playing decent defense, average true shooting. I really wouldn't call Terrence Ross too much of an MVP, but there's literally no one else to choose from on this team. So Magic, you guys need to get your stuff together. At the 11th spot, we have Jeremy Grant of the Detroit Pistons. Grant is averaging 22, 4, and 3 with 1 block and 0.7 steals per game. He has a 55% true shooting with 3 win shares. Grant has definitely developed into a solid score this year, and he is averaging up to 22 points per game. He has developed a lot this year, finding his own path as an NBA player, averaging 10 more points, 1 more rebound, and one and a half more assists. Grant is also a slightly above average NBA defensive player, but besides that, he isn't anything too special on the defensive end. Detroit is another team like the Magic without a serious path, but Jeremy Grant is definitely someone who's a building stone for the future. The one question I have with him is just how high is his ceiling and how much can he really be built around? Or is he going to be a good supporting piece for when they find their next true star? Colin Sexton is definitely someone I am having trouble trying to find his exact spot. Sexton is one of the better scorers on this list, averaging almost 25 points per game, 3 rebounds, 4 assists, a steal on 57% true shooting. He did also move over from the point guard to shooting guard spot this year, which has actually paid off pretty well for him. This year he's averaging 4 more points and 1 more assist. Sexton is also a pretty average defender, but he is also a bit undersized for the shooting guard position. Their point guard, Darius Garland, is another player who has developed well alongside Sexton. Both players are showing good improvement this year. Cleveland doesn't have too many building blocks to go around, but they certainly do have a backcourt that contend, at least offensively, with some of the best ones in the NBA. The evil empire of the standing on their last legs and have found themselves stuck in mediocrity. One of the few notable aspects of this team is DeMar DeRozan. 
Rosen is averaging 21, 4, and 7 with almost one steal per game while shooting 59% true shooting with 7 win shares this year. I did decide to put DeMar DeRozan above Colin Sexton but mostly because of his playmaking. DeRozan is averaging 7 assists this year, that is 2 more than he did the year prior and a few more than Colin Sexton is this year. DeRozan is also just a tiny bit better of a defender for his position than Sexton, but DeRozan is also a shooting guard playing the power forward position, by no means is he a specialized defender at all. But simply put, DeRozan is just a tiny bit more important to the Spurs than Colin Sexton is to the Cavs, as DeRozan does double the amount of win shares that Colin Sexton has, and he is also a better defender. For all these guys on the list, we are basically splitting hairs trying to find out which one is more valuable than the others and depending on how you rank points compared to win shares and compared to defense and passing will have a lot on how you rank these guys. Next we have Pascal Siakam. Pascal Siakam is a difficult player to measure. He is a skinny 6'9 power forward who isn't much of a shooter or a playmaker. Like DeMar DeRozan, he is a good NBA player who just doesn't have a skill set that meshes well with the current NBA. Regardless, he is an average shooter from two point range and scores most of his baskets unassisted. Siakam is a terrific defender with the ability to take up the forward, the number one forward on the opposing side, averaging 21, 7, and 4 with a 54% true shooting and 4 win shares. Siakam is a solid scorer, good rebound, and has shown a bit of a gradual improvement in his playmaking and passing, becoming a better passer and dribbler this year. But unlike some of the other guys above, I do believe that Pascal Siakam has hit his NBA ceiling. His three-point game this year has been absolutely abysmal. Of all players shooting more than four three-pointers per game in 40 games played, Siakam is the fourth worst shooter in the league. Siakam is also 26 years old, which is by no means old for an NBA player, but this is also the time when most players hit and find their ceiling, and when most players peak at their NBA careers. Siakam is definitely a good player, but I don't ever see him being the number one option or even the number two option on a championship team. Next is Shy Guy, wait. No, I mean Shea Gilgis Alexander. Much like the guys above him on this list, Shai has shown a ton of improvement this year, doubling his assists and averaging 4 more points per game while he has been more efficient from the field. Due to injuries, we haven't seen too much of Gilgis Alexander this year, but the games he's played, he has been exceptional. Scoring efficiently, making plays, and playing some amazing perimeter defense. The Thunder are still years away from developing into a contending team, but I do believe that Gilgis has the ceiling to be a number two or even a number one on a contending team. For the next part of this list, these are the guys who I believe have the potential to be a number one on a championship team. These are the guys bordering on stardom or who I believe are severely underrated when it comes to how well and how much NBA guys talk about these players. Speaking of underrated, that leads me to De'Aaron Fox. Averaging 25 points, 3 rebounds, 7 assists, a steal with a 56% true shooting and 4 win shears, Fox has become a star for Sacramento. He has improved as a playmaker, scorer, and a 3-point shooter this year. Fox is also 10th in all guards at finishing at the rim, shooting around 76% within 3 feet of the hoop. Fox is also above average when it comes to defensive play. Fox certainly has the makings of being a good all-around point guard as he is a strong playmaker, scorer, and defender. Every year he has shown improvement and right now he is still only 23 years old which is something that I think a lot of people forget about him. His best play is likely still in front of him and I don't think that we have seen his true ceiling yet. Christian Wood is another player who should be given a ton of respect for the amount of improvement he has shown this year. After bouncing around 6 different teams, he may have finally found his home in Houston. Wood is averaging 21 points, 10 rebounds, 1 block, and 2 assists per game with 3 win shares and nearly 60% true shooting. This is 8 more points, 1 more assist, and 3 more rebounds than he did last year in Detroit. Wood has also developed into one of the best shooting big men in the league, shooting 37% from 3 on 5 attempts per game. 
Houston was definitely in a dark place and didn't have a lot of direction after the James Harden trade, but Christian Wood is one player that they will definitely be able to count on for their future of the franchise. So these last four guys are all the true MVP contenders. If any of these four guys were on a top three team, they're most likely going to be in MVP conversation or even winning the MVP this year. The first player is Zion Williamson. I will admit, a few years ago I was not buying into the Zion hype. I thought he weighed too much or that his skill set wouldn't transmit well into the NBA, especially this year since he's playing along Steven Adams and Eric Bledsoe. But Zion has proved everything I thought about him wrong. He has lived up to the star predictions, averaging 27, 7, and 4 with half a steal, a block, almost 9 win shares, and a 64% true shooting. The man has been an absolute force this year, and along with the improved play of Brandon Ingram, those two are going to be an absolute duo, and the Pelicans have an incredibly bright future ahead of them. But with that being said, Zion Williamson is by no means a perfect NBA player. Zion is still a pretty average defender, and given his size and insane athleticism, it would be nice to see him being played more like lockdown defender. Zion is also a pretty terrible three-point shooter, and he isn't that good of a playmaker, but at least his playmaking has improved this year where he is averaging one more assist per game than last year. But Zion does struggle to score outside of the paint, taking 0.002% of his shots from 16 feet to 3 point range and 0.003 pointers while shooting only 29% from 3. While this is no means a negation to how dominant of a player he is and how he is able to win games, it is also a pretty severe weakness of his game. And as we've seen with Giannis Antetokounmpo in the past few seasons, by not having that extra range, he can be slowed down a lot more in the playoffs compared to the regular season. At the 3 spot, we have Carl Anthony Towns of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Cat has been one of the best centers since entering into the league, and recently he has developed into one of the most talented offensive centers of all time. Cat has a good post game, mid range game, is a talented 3 point shooter, and a great playmaker and dribbler for a center. This year, Carl Anthony Towns is averaging 25, 11, and 5 with 1 block and 61% true shooting percentage. He is also averaging nearly 40% from 3 off of 6.5 shots per game. This is something that is nearly unheard of for a center. Cat has been incredibly complete when it comes to an offensive play as a center, but the one drawback Cat has is his lack of defense. Carl Anthony Towns has always been a pretty average down low defender, which is usually unheard of when it comes to star big men. Cat is not a terrible and is cancer level defender, but he is also nothing special on the defensive end. He is such a terrific offensive player that his sometimes defensive drawbacks don't even matter. The runner up to MVP is Bradley Beal. Beal is averaging 31 points per game with a 59% true shooting. He has been an amazing scorer this year while keeping up great efficiency. Right now in the season, he's also averaging almost 5 assists and 5 rebounds to add on to his 31 points. Beal has definitely launched himself into stardom as he is likely to finish as the scoring champion this year, and there is a good reason as to why free Bradley Beal was trending for so long earlier this year. He is a great scorer who is also a solid rebounder and an average defender for his position, but the one drawback I have on him is his teammate, the former MVP Russell Westbrook. Now if Westbrook was playing like how he was to start off this season, Beal would have been the MVP on this list, hands down. But Westbrook has kicked it into a second notch after the All-Star break. Post All-Star break, Westbrook has been averaging a triple-double while scoring more points, assists, and rebounds and just being a more efficient scorer. Meanwhile, Beal has been scoring less, getting less assists, and less rebounds per game. While Beal certainly hasn't been a bad player since the All-Star break, he has slowed down from his terrific play at the beginning of 
the season. And this means that the MVP of non-playoff teams goes to Zach Levine of the Chicago Bulls. Levine is averaging almost 28 points per game with 5 rebounds, 5 assists, 63% true shooting, and nearly 6 win shares. Levine has developed into one of the best scorers and one of the most efficient scorers in the league. This year, he is also a much improved playmaker and a much improved defender. Levine has also developed beyond his dunker stage and beyond his scorer stage into a star who can actually lead a team. This year was his first all-star selection and I guarantee you this will not be his last. At only the age of 25, Zach Levine is quickly becoming a household name and has the potential of being the number one option on a championship team.